The best vehicles are usually born out of some sort of need. The Boxster from Porsche's need to make money, the Veyron from Bugatti's need to make the fastest car in the world, and the GT40 from Henry Ford II's need to beat Enzo Ferrari at his own game. The story goes that in 1963, Ford, that is, Henry Ford II, alongside his general manager Lee Iacocca, well, they wanted to go racing, and to be known as a true performance brand, and when you're the single richest car manufacturer in the world, the simplest path to success is to shill out a whole bunch of cash. Ford didn't really have much experience in racing, and no other manufacturer in the world had the level of experience and success as Ferrari. So Big Henry decided that he would buy Ferrari. And why not? Ferrari had just won Le Mans four years in a row. I'm sure many of you know the story by now. Old Enzo, though thoroughly tempted by Ford's cash offer, felt his company and especially his racing program slipping away, and he decided to stop negotiations. So those in charge over at Ford decided to set out on their own to build their own Ford race car, one that would be purpose-built and designed from the ground up with one goal in mind, to beat Ferrari at Le Mans. What's always fascinated me about this story is the question of how. How did Ford go about developing such a car in such a short amount of time, a car capable of racing competitively and dominating for upwards of a decade after its release with few changes, up against the absolute best and most storied successful manufacturers in the world, not just Ferrari, but also Porsche and Alfa Romeo and others. What was it about the GT40 that made it such a perfect formula for endurance racing, and why is it still to this day known as one of the single most legendary sports cars of all time. Before we go any further, I want to give a massive shout out to Rec Watches, probably my favorite brand that I've worked with. Rec is a Danish company that creates incredible automotive inspired timepieces, and their name stands for Recover, Recycle, Reclaim, which is a philosophy that they really live by. They craft watches from materials sourced from legendary vehicles. I personally own this Rec Tourer, which I absolutely love, and I've got one of their stunning Lotus 98T watches that is on the way. But if you're a fan of the Ford GT and the history around it, you're going to want to stick around for this. Rec has just launched another remarkable limited edition collection, this time honoring the iconic Ford GT40. These watches are crafted using actual aluminum from the first production GT40 in history, that is chassis P1001. Available in three striking editions, each design reflects one of the historic liveries worn by P1001 throughout its racing career. There's the Essex Wire Edition which is inspired by the car's 1966 Le Mans debut, featuring a bold white, red, and black color scheme. Then there's the Sydney Taylor edition, which is a tribute to its time with Sydney Taylor Racing, dressed in green, white, and gold. And then the FAV Shelby edition, capturing the original Shelby blue and Wimbledon white livery. Every detail of these watches really embodies the spirit of the GT40, from the black pump-style chronograph pushers to the caseback design, which is inspired by the GT40's racing steering wheel. And most impressively, the tachometer scale, again, is made from that repurposed aluminum aluminum, specifically aluminum coolant pipes, from chassis P1001 itself. On the watchmaking side, this is a mechanical chronograph powered by a beautifully finished manual movement. If you're into mechanical watches, I highly recommend that you dive deeper just into the craftsmanship behind this timepiece. It really does reflect the exclusivity and quality of Rex limited edition watches. The watch features an integrated bracelet, a 40 millimeter case diameter, and a thickness of just over 13 millimeters, making it incredibly wearable. If you're interested in owning not just an exceptional watch, Watch, but a true piece of automotive history, check out the link in the description below, but act fast because these will sell out quickly. And huge thanks to Rec Watches. Now let's get back into it. Building a car that could win Le Mans was no simple task, and Ford needed help. So they reached out to a man named Eric Broadley, owner of Lola Cars, with the goal of taking his Ford-powered Mark VI GT and turning it into the dream Ford race car. The team, known as FAV, or Ford Advanced Vehicles, tasked with creating and building this car were Eric, but also a man named John Wire, formerly the racing manager of Aston Martin, and Britton Roy Lunn from Ford's engineering research department. Now the biggest problem facing this group was that they didn't all exactly agree on the direction this project should go, and in some ways this could be the reason the early version of the GT40 just wasn't performing the way that Ford envisioned, still that didn't stop them from creating the first prototype in about a year. The first thing to note is the car's layout, namely its mid-engine layout, just like that of Ferrari's recent 250p race car. Interestingly enough, this wasn't Ford's first 
foray into the world of mid-engine race car development. Just a year prior, they were working on this car, which is really the first car to bear the Mustang name, the Mustang 1, a small mid-engine race car meant for FIA Group 4 and SCCA C&D Sports Racing. Despite the fact that it never got very far beyond the concept stage, and the Mustang name would move over to the pony car segment, this car was important for Ford as they developed the GT40. This car was not only mid-engine, it also had fully independent suspension, and it also was 40 inches tall like the GT40. Now, at the heart of the original GT40 was the 4.2 liter, 350 brake horsepower Indianapolis V8 engine. In 1963, Ford had collaborated with Lotus and Colin Chapman, marking the beginning of a revolution for the Indianapolis 500. Chapman, along with drivers Jim Clark, brought the mid-engine Lotus 29 to the Indianapolis 500, challenging the traditional front-engine roadsters, and to power this innovative car, Ford developed this 4.2-liter V8, which was based on their Fairlane small-block V8 architecture but heavily modified for racing. Perhaps the biggest departure for Ford at this time was the fact that though the GT40 started out with a pushrod V8 version of this engine, it soon switched to a double overhead cam engine, not the typical overhead valve pushrod American V8 that we all know and love. The radical design of the original GT40 as a sleek, low-slung, unique car was the result of extensive wind tunnel and computer testing, really advanced stuff for this time. Now, sadly, the car's first public outing uh, really showed its need for refinement especially in the simple fact that the car wanted to fly away at high speeds. Its first public appearance on track was set to take place in April of 1964 for the official Le Mans testing. One of the cars, in fact, did fly away and crash at 150 miles per hour. It was here that not only this problem became apparent, making the general public wonder if Ford even knew how to use their fancy computers and wind tunnels, but on top of this, the gearbox was entirely inadequate to handle the torque of the engine. In simple terms, the car was nowhere near where it needed to be to take on Le Mans and take on Ferrari, and so a new direction was in order for Ford if they were going to build the ultimate GT race car. So Control would leave Great Britain and FAV. Interestingly enough, FAV would actually take over the production version of the GT40, and if you remember the wreck watches we were talking about earlier, my favorite version, the FAV Blue model, is based on the original Shelby Blue and Wimbledon White production model of the GT40. 40. Regardless, it was time for Ford to bring the development of the GT40 home to America from Great Britain, and specifically to a man named Carroll Shelby. There are few things more valuable when developing a race car than race experience itself, and Carroll Shelby had just that. And not just any race experience, he'd taken Aston Martin to their lone Le Mans victory in 1959, and so when he received a few of the GTs in 1965, he knew he had his hands full. At this point, the double overhead cam Indy engine had been dropped, Dropped. It didn't make enough torque, and a high-revving engine wasn't really great for endurance racing, especially 24 hours of endurance racing. So the GT40 was powered by a modified version of the 289 Windsor engine. Shelby tested out the 327 or 5.3 liter V8. They also beefed up the problematic Kaladi engine, and more important than anything, they began working on the car's problematic aerodynamics. Despite being incredibly low slung and, well, really cool looking, the car's overall shape was in some ways fighting itself, so they began experimenting with the shape both on the racetrack and in the wind tunnel. The GT40 was a low, wide, and powerful car, but its aerodynamics were actually pretty underdeveloped. It lacked significant downforce at high speeds, which made the car unstable, especially in corners and on fast straights. This instability was exacerbated by the flat floor and low-slung design, which created turbulence around the rear of the car. The early GT40 models also suffered from excessive drag, its large frontal area combined with underbody turbulence, leading to a drag coefficient that was way too high for endurance racing. This reduced top speed and also put stress on the engine and tires. In addition to aerodynamic drag, the GT40 also had cooling problems at high speeds as the car's airflow was not optimized to direct air to the radiators and engine compartment effectively. And so the GT40's success 
would ultimately be the result of good old-fashioned American work ethic. Carroll Shelby and his team spent countless hours working on the design of the car, leading to a series of significant changes to improve the aerodynamics and performance of the GT40, and here's how they approached the problem. First, as mentioned, the team used extensive wind tunnel testing. Now at this time, wind tunnels were a relatively new and evolving technology, but they allowed the engineers to visualize and refine the airflow over the car. And so the GT40 underwent detailed tests to measure airflow over its body, examining things like lift and drag and downforce. Shelby's team worked with Ford engineers, including Roy Lunn, to implement various modifications to the body shape to reduce drag and improve the car's handling. These adjustments were really subtle, but they were effective, you know, shaping the front nose and rear to reduce drag and improve airflow. One of the most significant aerodynamic fixes was the development of the long tail rear end, which, you know, became known as the Mark II GT40. The original GT40 had a relatively short rear, which created turbulence behind the car and contributed to poor downforce. The longer rear end allowed better airflow, improved high speed stability, and more consistent aerodynamic flow over the entire car. The added length also helped to reduce drag and allowed for a more streamlined design, which contributed to higher top speeds. Another change was made to the front nose of the car. The original nose design created lift and was too blunt, leading to instability at high speeds. And the new design featured a lowered and more sculpted front end, which improved airflow over the car's front body and reduced lift. One of the most significant aerodynamic changes was also the addition of a rear wing or spoiler, which, as I'm sure you know, helps to create downforce. This was especially important for Le Mans because stability at high speeds was so critical. The underbody of the GT40 was also improved to reduce drag and turbulence. Shelby's engineers smoothed out the floor and worked on minimizing air turbulence underneath the car. As part of the testing process, Shelby's team also worked closely with tire manufacturers to ensure the tires could handle these increased speeds and downforce. Testing showed that the tires needed to be upgraded to handle the more aerodynamically stable and faster GT40s. And you know, hard work pays off. In 1965, Ken Miles and Lloyd Ruby would take the GT40's first international win at the grueling Daytona Continental over the previously European dominant manufacturers, especially Ferrari, who had dominated that race for about a decade. The aerodynamic problems were solved, but one last change in the form of the 427 cubic inch V8 would take the GT40 to the next level and would enable them to completely dominate Le Mans starting in 66, taking the 1, 2, and 3 spot. Ford would then take the win in 67 and 68, and perhaps most brilliantly, just barely beating the Porsche 908 in 1969 by a mere 120 feet, despite really very few changes to the car over the years. The amazing thing is that this Ford, if it manages to win this race today, is the same doggone car that won it last year. And there were seven, a squadron of seven factory Porsches brought here, only one is now running, and it at the moment looks destined for second place. Ford's got it. The Ford's got it. There's no earthly way the Porsche can do it. Ford, the very same car that won in 1968, wins the 1969 24 Hours of Le Mans. The GT40 stands as one of the most iconic and successful race cars in automotive history. Its dominance in endurance racing, especially at Le Mans, came about both because of deliberate engineering innovation, but also the ability to adapt to just the high-pressure world of motorsport. While there was some evolution over its lifespan, the GT40's success was largely driven by a few key factors that set it apart from the beginning. First, it's the simplest equation for racing, an extraordinary combination of power paired to low weight and aerodynamics alongside, you know, incredibly robust reliability and just engineering excellence. One of the defining characteristics of the GT40 that really helped create its lasting dominance was its engine. The early iterations of the GT40 were powered by the Ford 289 V8, which gave it a nice balance of power and reliability, but it wasn't the most powerful engine. Ford and Shelby's engineers continued to refine the engine's output, improving fuel delivery and heat management system, you know, ensuring that it would last over the grueling 24 hours of Le Mans, but it's really the GT40 Mark II that was introduced in 65 
this is the car that took on a new level of competitiveness necessary to compete with the Europeans at Le Mans. The Mark II featured the much more powerful 427. This engine was making around 485 horsepower. It had better acceleration, and if you watch these races, it's especially apparent in the first few years just how fast this car was. This powerful engine allowed the car to stay competitive, even against Ferrari's more advanced machinery. While the Mark I had proven itself in earlier races, it was this Mark II that really secured Ford's dominance, winning Le Mans in 66, 67, and beyond. And can I just say, we need to appreciate the manic sound of this thing. It's just unreal. Another major factor in the GT40's dominance was its revolutionary design, which was specifically created to optimize aerodynamics and handling for endurance racing. In the 1960s, the ability to create cars that could handle the high-speed straights and sharp corners of endurance racing tracks like Le Mans was crucial for long-term success. The car's incredibly low profile, one that you really can't comprehend seeing if you just see the car by itself without the perspective of a person. I mean, it's so low to the ground. This was one of the most significant design features. It reduced drag, it enhanced stability at high speeds, it did make for some difficulties at the beginning, but once they got it figured out, it was a perfect formula. As much as speed and power and handling matter, Endurance racing, especially at this time, was just as much about reliability and the car's ability to withstand the grueling condition of a 24-hour race. The combination of Ford's engineering and Shelby's expertise in building robust cars meant that the GT40 could take an absolute beating on the track. These cars were meticulously maintained and their engines and transmissions were continuously upgraded to handle the strain of these long races. While other manufacturers like Ferrari and Porsche were a little more focused on just raw speed, Ford was really committed to building a car that could go the distance and this really proved to be a strategic advantage. The team also was so good at just making adjustments based on real-time feedback from drivers during test sessions. For example, Ken Miles, one of the most important drivers of the GT40 program. He provided critical feedback on how the car's handling could be improved, especially in high-speed corners. And Shelby's team worked tirelessly to implement those improvements, constantly modifying the suspension and the aerodynamics, and this adaptability meant that the GT40 could continue to improve as these racing seasons progressed. I think the GT40 is really Ford's greatest example of function leading to form. It was and is such a unique sports car, unlike anything else, and this came out of a pure, almost childish, vindictive desire to beat Ferrari. And you know what? I think all of this was not just good for Ford, but also good for Ferrari and good for Porsche as well. It really pushed those companies to become what they are today. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I thoroughly enjoyed learning more about the legendary GT40. We'll see you guys in the next one. Drive safe.